Former Washington Commanders quarterback Carson Wentz may have just seen his starting career in the NFL come to an end. We got all that and much more on today's episode of Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL. Your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. What is going on, football fans? And welcome in to another episode of Locked On NFL, your daily podcast covering the National Football League. Got all the biggest stories from around the NFL in less than 30 minutes. We appreciate you as always making us your first listen of the day every day. Don't forget we're available uh, for free on all of your podcast apps and on YouTube as well. And we are your Tuesday host this week. Myself, Ross Jackson at Ross Jackson Nola. We also got David Harrison at D Harrison 82 coming with us from Indianapolis. Robbie headed on Thursday. We're getting ready for the NFL Combine on today's episode of Lots of NFL. We're going to dive into some Combine talk, the prospects that David and I are most excited to see in Indy. We'll also take a look at Derek Carr headed to the combine himself to make sure that he's, uh, you know, dealing around with some teams. David, you know how those backdoor deals in Indy go all the time. And of course, we got to start off today's episode, though, with Carson Wentz, the former now Washington, Washington Commanders quarterback released today on Monday as we get you ready here for the Tuesday episode. And David, you know this situation intimately as you cover the Washington Commanders. Before we kind of get into some places where he might land, can you give us a little bit of insight in terms of the relationship, how this all came to be? Yeah, so I mean, going back to when the Washington Mayors traded for Carson Wentz in the first place, obviously there was a lot of of skepticism uh, about the trade, not only giving giving away mid-round picks in order to get a very troubled quarterback who went to his third team in in three years Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all that stuff, but also just because there, there are so many questions about his leadership ability, and he's coming in, handed the starting job over a quarterback by the name of Taylor Heineke, who just oozes leadership. You know what I mean? And and, mm-hmm. and so it was just kind of the 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 differences between the two. You know, we're, we're night and day. Carson Wentz has a strong arm. Taylor Heineke not so much. Carson Wentz a little bit more accurate. Taylor Heineke not. Taylor Heineke more mobile and a better leader. So I mean, it was just it was like if you could take the two. And I remember having this conversation at training camp. If you take the two and just put them in a blender and turn them into one guy, mm, you mm-hmm. you probably have a Hall of Fame quarterback. But that's not the case, unfortunately. And really, as it kind of goes through, it was just always kind of a wait and see, wait and see, wait and see. Well, the moment we saw was the loss to the Tennessee Titans early on uh, in mm. the season. The Washington Commanders were on the on the goal line, knocking on the end zone, trying to get in. It was Brian Robinson's first game back uh, from his injury. Came out to many men. And, and I remember in the, in the press box looking to my left and right and saying, this is it. Like Carson mm-hmm. Wentz or Brian Robinson Jr. Is, is potentially about to become a hero to this fan base. Carson Wentz throws an interception at the goal line. Uh, the Tennessee Titans win. And that essentially is the moment I think you can turn to and say the Washington Commanders roster was never going to believe that he was the guy that was going to get them over the hump. And if that's if you lose the roster, I mean, everybody knows you lose the locker room, you've lost your job. That's absolutely it. And now you've got Carson Wentz, who started off two and five as the Washington Commanders starter, was then seceded. Now, this was because of injury. He wasn't benched, but you have to feel like if it hadn't been for the injury, he would have been headed towards the bench one way or another. Taylor Heineke goes five and one. Later on in the season, they choose Sam Howell over him. And so now you've got second year quarterback going into a second year quarterback out of UNC, Sam Howell. That looks like he's going to be the successor over with the Washington Commanders. Is that accurate to say at least for now that is the feeling and that's basically Mm -hmm. what's coming out of the organization's mouth ron rivera has done multiple interviews at this point in time where he's talked about sam Howell getting the opportunity to be the starting quarterback and i do think that the way this message is being crafted is important because it doesn't mean that he just is the starting quarterback boom this is your time to shine go do it but he's going to get the opportunity and also the words competition competitiveness all these things are, are also coming out of ron rivera's mouth so i don't expect sam Howell to just be handed the keys to the franchise, what mm-hmm. I would like to see happen, and what I've said multiple times on DC radio, uh, an actual you know DC legend Doc Walker has actually supported this idea, and Ron Rivera himself even kind of hinted at it, and Taylor Heineke hinted at it, competing with Taylor Heineke because mm-hmm. when you look at Taylor's got limitations. I mean, th- there's no getting around it, right? But can the Washington Commanders win with them? Yeah, they can. They've they've proven that time and time again, 
And some of the games they've lost, they could have won. You look at the game they lost to the Minnesota Vikings, you certainly walk away from that game saying that team should have or even could have won. The difference or the problem I see with Taylor's time in Washington so far is he has never really been given the opportunity to compete for this job. Every time he's been the starter, it's re- right. it's replacing the guy that was handed the job. Like they tried to call Ryan Fitzpatrick and Taylor Heineke competition. There was no competition there. Fitzpatrick came in to be the starter and then he gets injured. Carson Wentz, there was never a competition there. There was nope. just your QB one from day one and you're going to be our guy. Let me see what happens. So what I want to see happen and what I think is going to happen, if I'm reading the words correctly, is Taylor Heineke and Sam Howell are going to compete to be the starting quarterback. As long as it's a legitimate competition and it's not just a competition. um, If Sam Howell beats Taylor Heineke and legitimately does so, the roster will support him. I promise you that. Mm -hmm. But if Taylor beats Sam, then they need to roll with Taylor and let Sam continue to develop behind the scenes because he and Taylor have an amazing relationship. That's awesome. That's great to hear. And that's good news for the Washington Commanders and where they're headed to. They make a big decision here moving on from Carson Wentz. I thought, David, that when Carson Wentz made the change and you know ended up in Indianapolis and he was with Frank Reich and this great coaching staff, that that would be the year that everything worked out for him. But if it yeah. didn't, then I thought that was going to be it for him. It didn't work out. They went to Matt Ryan soon after uh, they move on from Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz goes to Washington, and it was so clear. I think that three interception game against the Cleveland Browns was another big one there that I they, that always comes to, to my recollection. 11 touchdowns and nine interceptions on the season had just over an 80 passer rating out of the 36 quarterbacks that threw 200 or more passes in 2022. He had the sixth lowest. He was at number 30 on that list, not what you expect from Carson Wentz, or not what you expected from Carson Wentz after a very bright first year, very bright first couple of years, honestly, yeah. in Philly, derailed by the injury, of course, we know that, but has never really gotten back to what made him special uh, coming out of college. And now you have to wonder, are there going to be any teams out there that are going to be a good fit for Carson Wentz as a starter? Because truly, it's hard for me to think of any. Yeah, it's it's hard for me to think of any as well, honestly. I mean, I've I've had this kind of theory of the life cycle of a number one uh, overall quarterback, number one pick as a mm-hmm. quarterback. And I don't mean necessarily number one overall, but number one pick for a team. And like, obviously, Carson Wentz was the number one pick for the Eagles that year, where you kind of like you come in as the savior of this franchise who obviously needs a quarterback or else they would be drafting one. And then if that doesn't work, you get to be the savior of a second franchise. And in Carson Wentz's life, that's the Indianapolis Colts. Usually, if that doesn't work, you you now you now get resigned to bridge quarterback territory. Yeah. Um, Carson got a third chance at being a, a franchise savior. Like Ron Rivera sure. said over and over again, like he's my guy. He's the guy I believe in. So he actually got a third life uh, in in that phase. And now you look at it. So now should be the time he's going to bench or to bench quarter to bridge quarterback territory. But the problem is he's got so much baggage uh, surrounding his reputation as a supporting cast member. Um, and and not only was Sam Howell given the start in the last week of the game for the Washington Commanders, but it was Taylor Heineke was the backup, and Carson Wentz was was not was not an active part of the roster. On locker room cleanout day, Carson Wentz avoided the media. He wasn't present the entire time we were in the locker room, and you know that doesn't speak to who he is as a teammate. But it's kind of hard to try to come here and paint a picture of he could be a bridge quarterback, he could be a, a mentor to a younger mm-hmm. guy because. While Sam Howell will stand up for him, and I think that's great for Sam. And, and Carson did give Sam his boot, his his luxury, his luxury box, I guess, in FedEx, if you want to call it a luxury box, uh-huh. um, for Sam's family to watch his first start. And that's a great stand up move. But it's also kind of like, okay, but were you going to use it anyway as an inactive third string quarter? Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't know how much of a sacrifice that really was. So it's like it's really hard to sell him to any team in the National Football League, especially with a young quarterback. I mean, right. like the Miami Dolphins might be a, a spot that people say, because, you know, what if Tua gets injured again? The problem is, do you want a backup who might be hoping that your starter gets injured? Right. Is that really the situation that you want to have? Because that's never going to lead to anything positive uh, in that quarterback room. So that could be a bit of a culture uh, barrier too. the NFL right now working on the potential of having uh, a third quarterback rule, which would allow them to have 47 dress, which would include an extra dressed quarterback. Maybe that if that passes through the competition committee in the owners meeting in March, then maybe that opens the door for him a little bit. He's going to end up somewhere, but it's really, really hard to project exactly uh, where it's going to be. So really interesting story. You want to keep up with that and more going on with the Washington commanders, David Harrison and Chris Russell over at Locked on Commanders getting you taken care of. And of course, we'll have you covered here on Locked on NFL as well. Now, while we don't know 
where Carson Wentz is going. We also are still waiting to figure out where Derek Carr is going. And we got a little bit of an answer on Monday because Derek Carr is headed to Indianapolis to meet with a bunch of other teams at the uh, at the NFL Combine. So who will land the former Las Vegas Raiders quarterback? David and I are going to be breaking it down and giving some of our favorite fits as we continue on with today's episode of Locked On NFL. And today's episode of Locked On NFL brought to you by our friends over at Built Bar, the best tasting protein bar on the market. Yeah, you can find it over at Built.com. You can jump over to the website right now and you can see that chocolate chip cookie dough puff bar. So if you like chocolate chip cookie dough, if you like marshmallow, if you like 100% chocolate, then this is the perfect protein bar for you. And that's just one of many incredible flavors that you're going to find over at Built.com. And not only can you find it over at Built.com, if you have a local Walmart or a local Sam's Club, you can grab yourself some Built Bars there as well. For instance, over at Walmart, you can head over to the pharmacy section, get yourself a four box of the cookies and cream double chocolate or coconut puff flavors. And if you've got a Sam's Club, you can go and get that Baker's Dozen 13 bar box with hit flavors like brownie batter and churro. Don't worry, you can thank David and I later while you're enjoying your delicious, absolutely phenomenal protein bars that include 17 grams of protein, but only 130 calories and four grams of sugar. Just doesn't get any better than Built Bar. Find them again over at Built.com or at Walmart or Sam's Club today. All right, everybody, continuing on with today's episode of Locked On NFL. As always, thank you very much for making us your first listen of the day. David, I tease, I make jokes. This is what I do here on the show. I say Derek Carr is going to Indianapolis, but it doesn't mean he's going to the Colts, although maybe he could, but he Mm -hmm. is headed to Indianapolis so that he can get some of that nice combine backdoor dealing going on and get an opportunity to potentially meet with a bunch of other teams. We know the New Orleans Saints, We know the New York Jets are interested, a lot of momentum for both of those teams, but who are some other teams that could potentially be getting into the Derek Carr Chronicles, the Derek Carr lottery here in the offseason? I mean, honestly, it could be the Indianapolis Colts. It really could be, right? Like, it makes perfect sense. I mean, do you you really want to trade up? I mean, there's... There's a couple of schools of thought here, and and I think that the top like four or five draft picks in this year's class could go in a, in a numerous, uh, you know, in a in a lot of directions. But if you're, if you're in the Indianapolis Colts, you have the opportunity to potentially get a quarterback that can get you competitive. I mean, can probably get you an AFC South division title if you put the right weapons uh, around them and you keep your draft capital. And if it doesn't work out, then you come right back in what's arguably going to be a better quarterback class next year or even two years from now. I mean, there's there's some some young quarterbacks that are supposed to be developing. They're supposed to be pretty good. And, and I would remind every NFL franchise uh, that's listening to this show that every <laughs> year, every year, except for last year, right? Except for uh-huh. 2022, right. every right. year, there's a new franchise quarterback coming out of the National Football League. Sometimes they're 5'9", sometimes they're 6'6", six, six. sometimes they're from Alabama, sometimes they're from North Dakota State University. There's mm-hmm. always going to be a next franchise. Like Arch Manning is right around the corner. You know what I mean? So, right. I would just I would just caution teams and, and and I hate when I see this. Like I always go back to the Atlanta Falcons when they drafted Matt Ryan as like the blueprint, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Because if you go back to that Falcon squad, they put Matt Ryan on a very good roster. Extremely like, talented. You know what I mean? And mm-hmm. I think that's really the way to do it. And I know a lot of people like the rookie contract because you can go sign some key free agents and do all this other stuff. But I really still like the model of taking a good solid roster that needs a good strong leader and a couple more moves. And that's when you inject your rookie quarterback and then two, you have two or three years to finish the, the house around them mm-hmm. and take your run. And I mean, for the Falcons, look, they were successful for a lot of years. Um, didn't get a championship, got it, but they were successful almost. for a lot of years using that method. So I would I would almost caution the Colts to do it. But then they have Jim Irsay. So, I mean, you know, <laughs> so throw, who knows, throw Ricky really? Williams wig on him. He's Mike Ditka. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, who knows, really? Yeah, I look over like the top of the draft where you see a lot of quarter or a lot of quarterback needy teams. I think there's, you know, a lot to be said or with some of the teams in the NFC South, which of course you and I know very well. The Carolina Panthers are a good one, but you look at that coaching staff the Carolina Panthers are building uh, wow. around Frank Reich and bringing in all these talented developmental culture coaches and it kind of makes you feel like that's a team to really watch for that potential trade up to the number one spot if the Chicago Bears actually end up putting that on the market. That seems like a place that is ripe and ready for a rookie quarterback, but it doesn't go the same sort of team building route as what you discussed because they have a lot of questions all over the place elsewhere on the team. So if instead you wanted to be able to do both, 
you have an option here to where you can yeah. bring in a guy like Derek Carr to build your team around and then dig in for a quarterback later or draft one that's waiting behind. But is that a situation that Derek Carr wants to be in? I think that's the other piece that we have to watch here. You look at teams like the Indianapolis Colts, the Carolina Panthers. I'll even throw the Houston Texans in just for the sake of conversation mm -hmm. here and say that are those places or, or question, are those places that Derek Carr wants to go knowing that with a top 10 selection and in many of those other cases that we named top five, top three selections, knowing that one of those picks could go to a rookie quarterback that's immediately breathing down your neck. And yeah. does that kind of match up similarly to the kind of effect that we mentioned that a Carson Wentz would have waiting for a back, you know, waiting as a backup for a potential starter to be injured. So instead, I look at some of the other teams that maybe don't have everything that they need pieced together just yet, but could use a little bit of that help. What if Seattle gets concerned that Geno Smith isn't going to be an option for them uh, in 2023 because he played an incredible season? in 2022 what if a team like the tennessee titans decides that they're still because they don't really seem very sold on malik willis let's just be honest here yeah. and T uh, ryan Tannehill might not be around is Derek carr a guy that can plug in and basically be the same quarterback that ryan Tannehill was but maybe a little bit better in the end game situations for you as one mm -hmm. of the i think he's like top five in terms of active quarterbacks in fourth quarter comebacks and game winning drives and then obviously I have to say the New Orleans Saints, right? Yeah. Like that's an easy landing spot for them, as are the the New York Jets. But the Jets are going to wait to see what happens whenever Aaron Rodgers comes from underground or wherever he is <laughs> and, and makes his decision. They're prioritizing that over Derek Carr. So it seems like right now, one of the only landing spots that's kind of just saying, all we want is Derek Carr is this team, the New Orleans Saints. Outside of that, everybody's got another option somewhere. So how does that yeah. play into Derek Carr's sort of mentals when it comes into making his choice? It should play big. I mean, yeah. honestly, you know what I mean? I, I mean, it, w it would matter to me. I think, you know, the team that really wants you is the team that you should probably go with. And the New Orleans Saints clearly, clearly want Derek Carr because they're not, you know, being rumored anyway. If, if they're shopping around, they're doing a very good job of keeping a lid on it, which I mean, <laughs> Look, the New Orleans Saints have done some things that they've kept a lid on for a while in mm -hmm. the past. Just, yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, they've, they've been pretty good at, at hush hush every now yeah. and then. Some yeah. some things um, need more hush hush than others. But that's OK. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, honestly, like as much as like any Bucks listener who listens to the Locked On Bucks podcast, can hate to hear me say it. Like if I'm Derek Carr, I'm going to the New Orleans Saints. That, that's where I'm going to go. You have a division that's winnable. Uh, you know, the, the Buccaneers appear set to start, you know, third year quarterback, zero starts. Kyle Trask, uh, the Carolina Panthers have, I don't know, a lot of nothing, essentially, maybe a trade up for a rookie, which yeah. is, doesn't usually go well in the first year. And then the Atlanta Falcons have maybe Desmond Ritter, maybe Jameis Winston. I don't know what's going to happen with the Atlanta Falcons <laughs> quarterback. Room. But, you know, I mean, so honestly, that's that's probably where I would go. Uh, but I have a feeling like this is going to come down to Aaron Rodgers. And yeah. if Aaron Rodgers goes to New York, obviously the question is the contract, right? And, and yep. I don't know all the particulars, but we've seen more and more trades now where the team getting the player also takes the contract, right? Yep. And that, that doesn't usually happen. Usually the team takes that that sends the player gets a lot of dead cap space. If the Packers can can somehow get the Jets to take Aaron and all of his money, which is gonna drastically reduce the package they get in return if they get anything in return at all, mm -hmm. honestly, then maybe they go after a guy like Derek Carr to pair him with their talented young receivers who still need some developing time, a solid defense. Then you look at the draft class, you can bolster your offensive line. This is possibly the best tight end class to come out in a long time. You can go mm -hmm. get yourself a Dalton Kincaid out of Utah that I think would go well with a guy like Derek Carr. Not Darren Waller-esque, right? But right. a similar type of tight end. And you've got some running backs. I mean, that honestly, that's not... If I'm the Green Bay Packers, if I can get Derek Carr to agree to, to come to us, uh, maybe I'd just take a seventh rounder from the Jets to get rid of Aaron Rodgers and all of his dead money to bring in Derek Carr and then keep my draft capital and go elsewhere. Yeah, I mean, why not, right? I mean, I think that there's there's a big one now. I, I mean, unless they're unless they're really really feeling Jordan Love, but have we really seen any evidence to that, right? And maybe that's for obviously. yeah. I mean, that you know, I know Peter Bukowski over at Locked On Packers has gotten very excited about Jordan Love at certain times, but have the Packers been as excited as we are to see him? Because then what happens? You potentially could ship off Jordan Love and recoup some more draft uh, draft capital right. if you right. needed to, right? If you're not set, if you're not sold on him, you're gonna get another five to potentially, let me be careful how I say this, five 
let's say five to eight years, potentially five to 10 years out of Derek Carr, if you can, you know, get him in a system that keeps him protected and that, you know, he works with and that you want him around for that long. Like there's still another potential contract in Derek Carr's future if he's able to play as a top 15 quarterback, which is not a big ask because he's done that before. And so, yeah, I think the Green Bay Packers could be a really interesting one because then it also gives us an opportunity to go, okay, well, then now where's Jordan Love going? Because ain't no way Jordan Love is sticking around to be chosen over yet again. And so we would see exactly how that happens. Yeah. Chicago, after they trade Justin Fields because they don't (laughs) like football decision making. (laughs) If the if the Chicago Bears trade (laughs) Justin Fields, I'm going to lose my mind. I'm going to lose my mind about the Chicago Bears. So stay tuned, because if that happens, you'll want to come back to the show on a Tuesday. I don't care if that trade happens on a Wednesday. I will pay. I will yeah. pay either Tyler Rowland or Alex Clancy for a spot on their Thursday show so I can complain about the Chicago Bears. And I will do it not with grace, but with fervor. Uh, coming up next, the NFL Combine starts this week, and there are some prospects ready to steal the show. Who are David and I most excited to see? We've got one prospect each on the offensive and defensive side for you as we continue on with today's episode of Locked On NFL. All right, everybody, wrapping up today's episode of Locked On NFL with the NFL Combine right around the corner. It's not even right around the corner anymore, David. It's like two houses down at this point, literally like a house down. Uh, once we get to Indianapolis, because all the hotels are like right there. David, of course, in Indianapolis right now, getting ready for the NFL Combine. So we thought we'd come in here with two prospects, one offensive, one defensive each, to kind of highlight who we're most excited to see uh, up against or up against in, up against the drills, I guess, up against air, uh, up against their underwear. I don't know. We'll see how it all goes. But let's start over on the offensive side, David. Who is an offensive prospect that you're excited to see in Indy? Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing East Carolina. Running back, I suppose. Ah, uh-huh. uh, Keaton Mitchell. I mean, he, he's a guy that's not getting a whole lot of burn in what's a what really good uh, running back draft class. It looks mm-hmm. like this year, um, 185 ish pounds mm-hmm. is 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 the way that this is being listed. We'll see. But I mean, the dude is going to have speed for days. Um, agility needs to be off the charts. I mean, the, the way he's going to go through these drills, he he's the kind of guy that I think people well, like when they when they when they nuke their nachos to sit on their recliners to watch really fit guys do a lot of exercise for a whole day <laughs> like the contrast between the audience and the show is just completely different like it's it's amazing to me and i'm one of those nacho guys yeah i was just um, saying we're part of that audience by the way right right yeah. <laughs> um keen mitchell is going to be one of those guys that really gets a lot of buzz after the nfl draft and and you know there's going to be some people who are like oh you know he he could be a guy who's now he's at like an early day too and you know look scouts and gms are not going to go that crazy about him but he's a guy that doesn't fit a need in any offense, but he's a guy that can unlock a lot of creativity. Yeah. And I mean, if you let the Kansas City Chiefs get your, get their hands on this guy, no Eric Bieniemy or no Eric Bieniemy, I was about to like, say it yeah. could be it could be game over. You might want to go put a bet on Fanduel for the Chiefs win the Super Bowl. They get <laughs> Darius Tony, Isaiah Pacheco, and this kid. So, uh, yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, but I think he's gonna I think he's gonna set the combine floor on fire. Um, we'll see how he interviews. You know, the the media interview will kind of give you a little bit of insight on how he interviews with the teams. But I think at the end of the day, he has an opportunity to come in and create a lot of buzz. And in an entertainment business, which the NFL is an entertainment business, that buzz could lead a team to falling in love with him a little bit more. Than maybe they would have before. Yeah, completely possible. I mean, this is one of those prospects coming out of a small school that, if nothing else, a good combine performance forces you to go back to the tape, right? You yeah. go back to the tape. And then for some players, which we'll discuss here in a moment, that could be a bad thing. But for a lot of players, uh, that could be a good thing. Sticking on the offensive side for me, I'm also going to go with the running back, but I'm going with UCLA running back Zach Charbonnet. This kid, 6'1", 220-ish, is probably going to run somewhere like in the four fives, which in today's NFL and in the you know today's kind of like underwear Olympics and everything like that, everybody wants to see the 4'3", everybody wants to see the 4'4", and all that. But when you are 6'1", 220, and you're blazing four, five speed. That's pretty good. And he might even come in faster than that dude forced. I think it's 141 missed tackles during his collegiate career, both in the rushing and passing game. He is incredibly tough to tackle, not just because he's a freaking bowling ball, but he's also got elusiveness as well. He's quick. Short area quickness is outstanding. Uh, Really good low center of gravity. Does a great job operating his leverage secure ball carrier as well, can catch the ball downfield, can catch the ball out of the backfield, all that. 
just does a ton of everything. So he's going to be one of those guys that I will tell folks, don't just watch the workouts, watch the on-field drills too, because you're going to see just how quickly he cuts, how sure his hands are, how just confident he is out on a football field. Zach Charbonnet, the UCLA running back, is the offensive player I'm most excited to see at the Combine this year. Yeah, honestly, I think, I mean, I don't know that there are 32 impact running backs in this year's class, but if all 32 NFL <laughs> teams don't draft a running back, they, they miss something. Yeah. Like there's, yeah. There, it certainly feels that way, back. doesn't it? There's like, yeah, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> there's a ton of these guys. <laughs> all right, David, let's switch. Let's turn the page over to the defensive side, a player on the defensive side that you're um, looking forward to seeing and evaluating at the combine. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing Joey Porter Jr., the Penn State defensive back. Unfortunately, it's it's really kind of for the wrong reasons, but I'm hoping to get the right result here, yeah. right? So yeah. Joey Porter Jr., honestly, and some of his evaluation and, and just kind of like the way he's built and, and some of the, he reminds me of Greedy Williams. And Greedy mm-hmm. Williams coming out of LSU, there was a good amount of like fan and media hype uh, around Greedy Williams and what he could be and had some really high projections on day one in the first round of the NFL draft. And as we kind of went through the process, you kind of noticed that like that buzz sort of fell off a little mm-hmm. bit, a little bit. Still a day one guy entering the combine. And then the combine, I mean, it was just, it was on the, you know, it's, it's recorded. It's on television. Like people are in the stadium. People are watching in the media workroom here in Indianapolis. Like the footwork was just disgusting. It was just, it was terrible. Mm-hmm. And everybody said, and what you said earlier, right? So everyone went back to the tape. So, okay. Like, is this, is this something that shows up on film? And yeah, it showed up on film. It just turned out that LSU was apparently pretty good at hiding it and not asking him to do things that he wasn't able to do. When you get to the National Football League, you're going to need to be able to do all that kind of stuff. You can't just be a long physical guy and press coverage 24-7 in today's NFL. It's just not going to work. And unfortunately, and, and there have been some injuries you pointed out in pre-recording, mm-hmm. but there have been some injuries that have kind of him, hampered him, but he hasn't really ever lived up to that initial draft hype nope. uh, that he had. And I'm just worried that Joey Porter Jr., who's, who's a long athletic type of guy, but he's, he's much more of a press man coverage guy. The knock on him is that sometimes he gets lost in zone coverage, doesn't have the most fluid hips doesn't have the, the, the best ability to transition um, in coverage. And I, in today's national football league, and I've seen Joey Porter Jr. mock the Washington commanders a lot. Mm-hmm. And honestly, right now he looks to me like William Jackson, the third, and that thing exploded mm-hmm. in the commander's face and, and, and Jackson's face. Honestly, he didn't come to Washington to ruin his career. And I'm not saying his career is over, but like, you know, he was one of the most sought after free agents leaving Cincinnati. And yep. now, I mean, he went to Pittsburgh and you really never heard from him again. And we'll see what happens. Uh, this coming season with that back injury and everything else. So I'm just worried that this could be the moment. Like as as much as other guys could put on a show, Joey Porter Jr., if that footwork and that fluidity is not improved from what everybody is seeing on tape, he could also stand out in the combine for all the wrong reasons. Yeah. So we're watching for Joey Porter Jr., who could potentially be a first-round pick but could fall into day two, right, depending upon how this goes, just like we saw Greedy Williams years ago. Zach Charbonnet, probably a day two selection, potentially second round. Could Keaton Mitchell end up playing his way into that day two status? I think that like this, this is an interesting topic because people, players, prospects, they don't just help themselves in Indianapolis. Sometimes they end up knocking their stock down. So it's going to be really interesting to see uh, how Joey Porter is able to come out or Joey Porter Jr., excuse me, is able to come out of all this. My defensive player is a big man, but not the biggest big man. I'm going with Pitt. The interior defensive lineman, Kalijah Kansi, he's coming in at about six foot, 270, 280 pounds. So he's a little bit undersized. And look, everybody's going to say because he's got a yellow helmet with the blue pit on the side of it. Everybody's going to say, oh, he reminds me of Aaron Donald and blah, 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 who is also undersized coming out of college. All right, let's stop yeah. with all this. That is not the guy that you're going to get with a Kalijah Kansi, and that's okay. You shouldn't have to be the greatest defensive player in the NFL, in or, and, and for a little stretch of time, probably the best player in the NFL, of course, as well, in order to be a potential first-round pick. And that's where Kalijah Kansi is. And I think when he gets an opportunity to take that six foot, 270, 280 pound frame out there, run, jump, move, do all the things that he does, knowing what's also on his tape, I've studied his tape, he's an incredibly efficient, disruptive pass rusher. And there aren't a lot of those guys in this year's draft. You've got some really good, uh, you know, pass rushing IDLs or interior defensive linemen. Kalaja Kansi's up there. Jalen Carter, of course, is up there. Brooks is up there. So there's a few of them that are up there. Jalen Carter, of course, out of uh, out of Georgia, who will also probably be a lot of fun if he tests. Uh, but 
I just think a guy like Kalaja Kansi has a lot of opportunity to solidify himself as an early day two, uh, late day one type selection with just the sheer athleticism he's going to put on display carrying his frame. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And and I think that uh, throughout his career, every time someone reminds everybody that Aaron Donald was undersized coming out of college, the NFL's urine test guy shows up uh, <laughs> at, his, at his front door. Um, you saw AJ I mean, Brown. Did you see that AJ Brown got a drug test after balling out at the NBA celebrity game? Did he really? Like All Star Weekend? Get out of my face! Sorry, go um, ahead. <laughs> it's random though. It's random. Guys. Random. It's all, it's all random. <laughs> none, none of this has anything to do. Random. With it. But yeah, random I mean, in that the players have no idea when it's going to happen, but yeah. the NFL knows very well what it's doing. That's all, that's all it is. Um, no, I, I, and and I think you love that like that kind of stuff, right? Because I mean, mm-hmm. by and large, like some of these scouts kind of already know kind of kind of some of this stuff you know and and that's kind of the fun part of being on ground to do this kind of stuff is you hear from some people uh behind the scenes kind of what other people are thinking like there's you know there's some players who who we kind of got a little bit of insight into while we're in mobile where people liked you know this specific player a little bit better than maybe the media and the fan base did and then you see in the last like couple of weeks since we left mobile to now the scouting combine like that specific player is now all of a sudden he's like maybe top five, top ten draft pick this year, mm-hmm. and all the fan sites and all the media sites are kind of like just catching up. But in reality, the NFL world has been here. Uh, but you know that's part of what this is about is getting these guys exposed to not just the NFL teams, but you know the media interview portion. The yep. reason the drills are televised is to also bring the fan and the media members a little bit closer to not only the evaluation, uh, but who these guys are. And, and yeah, every year somebody stands out. That you know you may be never even heard of uh, beforehand. Yep. Now all of a sudden you want that kid on your favorite team so you can buy their jersey and support them uh, for their Hall of Fame career. Yeah, absolutely. It's going to be a fun time in Indianapolis. David's going to be there. I'm going to be there. James Rapine is also going to be there. So James is actually yeah. off tomorrow. So that's going to be uh, Tony and uh, Tony Wiggins and Lauren Cox getting you ready for all the other biggest stories around the NFL. So make sure you're checking that out. Uh, and we appreciate you, uh, David Harrison, and I for coming through and making Locked on NFL your first listen of the day. Make sure you come back tomorrow to get the biggest stories around the NFL. And don't forget to also check out Locked on NFL Draft, especially with the combine on the way. Damian Parson, Keith Sanchez bringing you everything you need to know about the biggest names in this year's NFL Draft, as well as the sleepers uh, who could potentially change your favorite team's franchise. So find that wherever you get your podcast and on YouTube as well. Part of Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. David ton of fun man thanks so much for uh jumping in see you in indy Always. and we will see y'all here again very soon on the locked on nfl podcast part of locked on podcast network your team every day